All right, so this is the gear list that I use for the 2014 rifle elk hunt. I've got it posted down below and a link to the DIY Sportsman Facebook page. Now, this template I didn't come up with myself. I actually got it from souladventure.com. This guy's got a ton of great information about preparing for archery elk hunting. So I just took his basic template and just made changes based on the gear that I had and the fact that it would be a colder rifle season hunt rather than a warmer archery season hunt. So starting off with the packs, you can see I have two listed here. The idea is that I wanted to set up a base camp when I first went in and then I wanted to take a smaller day pack to actually hunt out of. Now there are packs on the market that would allow you to do both and they'd be lighter than just one of these packs. You know, packs like Kuyu, Everly Stock, Mystery Ranch. All of these have those dual purpose packs where you can pack them down into day packs if you want, but then they expand to haul meat. And those are like the three to five hundred dollar packs. This Alps Commander, Alps Outdoors Commander pack is like 110 bucks on Amazon. It's a cheap meat hauler is what it is. It got just rave reviews on the website. I felt like it was really comfortable when I used it. I never really had any sore spots, never had any troubles with it at all. But it's not a pack that I would want to use as a day pack to hunt out of. It's kind of noisy. It has little key rings that the pack attaches to the frame with. And if you do want to attach the main pack off of the frame, there's no straps to carry it on your back. So it's kind of limited in that sense. So I wanted to bring a second pack to use as a day pack. And I just used the Mountain Hardware Agama pack. It's the same one I used to carry my books in for college. Overall, the system worked great. I mean, when I used that Agama pack, it was like nothing. I was flying around the mountains as if I wasn't carrying anything at all. But in the future, you know, this is something that would be really easy to shave several pounds off of if I went with one of those more expensive packs that was a, a dual purpose pack. But it's really hard to justify that price, you know, that extra three, four hundred dollars when what I had worked and I'd only be saving maybe three to four pounds overall. So what I think I might do here next year is use that same Alps Outdoors Commander pack as my load, my meat hauler, my uh, base camp pack, and then actually use an REI Flash 18, which only weighs 10 ounces as my day pack. Shelter and sleeping, the REI Quarter Dome T1, it's not a bad tent. It's one of REI's lighter tents within their brand name. And now they've replaced it with just the REI Quarter Dome 1. They dropped the T off the name in their new line. It's a little bit, it's not ultra light. It's light, but you know, I could definitely shave off a pound by going with a different brand if I really wanted to. I would definitely would not, absolutely would not go with a bivy for this hunt. At least that rifle hunt. Archery season, yeah, maybe. But, I mean, just the fact that we got eight inches of snow in one day, with a bivy, I mean, you'd be covered. It just doesn't make any sense. Don't do it if you're thinking about it. Rifle hunt, go with the tent. The sleeping bag, I really like this bag. I'm pretty sure it's discontinued because I bought it from Thrifty Outfitters, which is the outlet section of Midwest Mountaineering, which is a local outdoor shop here in Minneapolis. But this bag, it's just under three pounds for a 15 degree bag, 600 fill down. I never once while I was sleeping got cold. It got down to, I would estimate 15 degrees the day that my boots and my pants froze. And that night I was wearing base layers, two pairs of socks, a down vest and my sleeping bag. And I was comfortable. I mean, outside of me, the tent was full of condensation, dripping down frost. I mean, there's just a mess in there, but I never actually got cold. Sleeping pad, Thermarest Ridge Runner Sole, small version. So with the sleeping pads, in my opinion, you know, and a lot of other people's opinions, if you use a full length sleeping pad, it doesn't really make a lot of sense from a weight standpoint, because from your knees down, you don't really need a pad there anyway. So just go with a small, it's about four feet long, covers all the portions of your body that are actually gonna need the pad and you can save on weight and space. Now this is a closed cell foam. I did have an inflatable one and the main reason I didn't bring it was because I've had it leak in the past on a trip. It's just a miserable mess to have to deal with. So I wanted it to be simple. 
I wanted it to be functional and I wanted it to be lightweight. And this Ridge Runner Close Cell Pad is super light at nine ounces. I think my inflatable one was closer to like 25 ounces. The only downside is it's not very compressible. You just basically curl it up into a big roll and cinch it down underneath the pack. But I mean, it worked. Uh, I don't really have any complaints. If I was using a smaller pack that it wasn't as easy to attach that pad to the outside, then yeah, maybe. And it wasn't super comfortable. I mean, it's, it's not that thick, so I would say maybe on average four or five times a night, I would turn from my back to one side, to the other side, back to my back. But it did the job. All the stuff so far that I've gone through has been stuff that I've already had, with the exception of the pack. I bought that Alps Commander for this hunt. I bought it back in the spring, so I used it for bear hunting. I used it for a couple other camping trips, but this was the main purpose that I bought it for. Everything else so far that I've gone through, I've already had. All right, cooking and drinking. So I really like this system that I got. And this is one of those things, again, where I can't take credit for it. Syntax 77 is a YouTube channel where I got the idea for this cook set from. And it's just really simple. It's the chock full of nuts coffee can. And then I can pack basically all the stuff that I need into that coffee can. And it weighs pretty equivalent to what you would get with a titanium pot, which can cost, gosh, $50 maybe. So inside that chock full of nuts can, I have my MSR pocket rocket stove, a Bic mini lighter, a little thing of waterproof matches as a backup, a piece of Reflectix that I use to grab the pot to take it on and off the stove so I don't burn my hand, and then I have my foldable spoon. And I also kept a little goo tube full of camp suds to wash it out, but then I realized that was kind of pointless because the only thing I was doing on this trip was heating up water. So I never had to use it. It was just a waste of space and a waste of weight. I think that in the future with this thing, what I could do is take that pocket rocket stove out of the red case that it comes in and then use a four ounce fuel canister instead of the eight ounce. I think I could have got by just fine with the four ounce one and then maybe fit all that stuff into that pot with the insulation. The other thing I want to do is get a new extendable spoon. That one that I have, it's more like a ladle. It's kind of tough to eat out of, but I need something long so that I can eat out of those big freeze-dried meal bags. So I gotta figure something out for that. Water filter, the Sawyer Squeeze, I love this thing. So this water filter is incredibly easy to use. It's way smaller and lighter than a pump style water filter. And you don't have to wait like what you do with the iodine tablets, taste fine. And it just comes with a little 34 ounce bag and the actual filter itself. And then to carry my water, I have two more of those little 34 ounce bags. So then when they're empty, they don't take up any space or weight in your pack. You know, it's like, like an ounce I think I have written down for those empty platypus platters. I, you know, 100% recommend this water filter. I'll bring it along on every camping trip that I go on. It's so easy to use, so lightweight. Just have no complaints about it at all. This is something I had before. I use it on the bear hunting trip, use it on other camping trips. Pack clothes, so you notice I have a packed clothes section and a gear that is worn or carried in section. And these were kind of intermixed. I think I planned on wearing more clothes than I actually did. I think on the hike in and out, all I wore was my base layers and everything else got packed into the pack. So that makes the total pack weight a little bit heavier than I have listed on here, probably closer to 50 pounds. But let's just go down the list. Merino wool socks times four. I only used two and really I only used one pair the entire time. The only time I took out a second pair was that really cold night. I put on a second pair of socks to have in the sleeping bag with me. But the other two pairs, I really had no need for at all. The boots I used were absolutely great, kept all the water out, so I could definitely save some space and weight there next time. Only bring two pairs of socks. Extra pair of boxers. Merino wool would be preferable. I had merino wool boxers that I used for 
the ones that I wore for most of the trip. And what's great about them is they're antimicrobial naturally, so they don't get that nasty stink. Under Armour base bottoms. I mean, Under Armour cold gear is Under Armour. It's not as good as Merino wool, but it's stuff that I've had since high school football. So it was really easy for me to just take that along. A lot of the times when I went out hunting, I was warm enough that I didn't need it. I wore it mainly just when I was sleeping or to start out the day and then I would take it off at some point and put it in the pack. This Mountain Hardware 800 fill down vest, it's a really nice vest. 8.4 ounces, it's incredibly lightweight, incredibly packable. I only wore it a couple times when I was actually hunting, but it's a nice peace of mind thing to have with. And I wore it a lot of times in my sleeping bag when I was sleeping. Great insulation layer and it's water resistant so it can have a little bit of water on it and you don't have to worry about the down losing its insulation. That's something also I should note about that sleeping bag, that Sierra Designs Ridge Runner. That thing had water on it. I mean, it wasn't soaked, but it definitely had running water on it from the condensation in the tent and that water resistant coating was enough to keep it dry on the inside. Blaze Orange PVC Poncho, $10 on Amazon. I got it because it was lightweight and I mean it's a piece of junk. I threw it away already but it served the purpose. I wore it when it was snowing. It's one of those one-time use pieces of gear and when I go out archery hunting this is probably something that I would look to invest in because those PVC poncho type things, yeah they keep the rain out but they're really loud. Walking through the woods they're not breathable at all so this is something where I would probably want to spend on a little bit nicer piece of gear for the next time I go out. Beanie, Blaze Orange Heavyweight. Yeah, this is just a Fleet Farm beanie. It's nothing special about it. Nice and warm. A camouflage neck gaiter. This thing's awesome to have when it's windy. I use it deer hunting. I used it out there a couple times. It doesn't take up that much weight or space, so it's really easy to just throw that one in the pack. And then a fleeceless hooded, fleece hoodless sweatshirt. Again, Actually, I don't think I used this at all. This thing was more or less my pillow for the trip because with the other jackets and base layers that I have, it was just one of those things where it provided me peace of mind, but it was just extra weight, extra 44 ounces in my pack that I didn't need. Toothbrush, toothpaste, baby wipes, backpacking towel, all that stuff's pretty self-explanatory in the hygiene section. Safety and essentials, map, I didn't go through the bother of waterproofing my map. I just printed off some maps from Cal Topo, overlaid with the slope angle shading. Really nice to look at. Uh, matched up well with the GPS. Compass and whistle, just real generic. Gotta have it. Waterproof matches, those were included in my cook kit. Didn't bring any backup lighters. I figured between the waterproof matches and the uh, Bic lighter, that should be all I needed. Camp soap, like I said before, that thing was kind of useless when all I was cooking was the freeze dried meals. Duct tape, fire tinder. I never actually made a fire. Matt and Travis made a fire a couple nights and it was nice for trying out gear, let me tell you. When I was off by myself, I didn't make a fire and it was definitely something that's nice to come back to. First aid kit. Self-explanatory, I like the one that I have. Never had to use it on the trip. I've actually only had, to, only had to use it once and that was when I was up in the boundary waters. That big pike that I caught, my hand slipped up in the inside the gill and I sliced my finger pretty good. That's the only time I've ever had to use that first aid kit. But it's something that you just gotta have. Emergency space blanket, might as well have it. Two ounces, could save your life, you never know. Especially up there if I would have, you know, fallen into a creek or something, got wet somehow during that big snowstorm or gotten hurt. That definitely would have been a very essential piece of gear to have. Hatchet, I just decided I didn't want to bring the extra weight and I wasn't going to make a fire. So that was a pretty piece, pretty easy piece of gear to leave behind. Same thing with the pen and notebook. My camera is my pen and notebook. That's what I take notes on. Hand warmers, didn't need them. Hands did get cold, I will say that. I was wearing Primaloft gloves and, I mean, 
It's just something that's tough to avoid. If I would have brought hand warmers, I would have needed to bring enough of them for every day and that's just adding a ton of weight to the pack. It's easier just to wait till your hands get cold and then pull the fingertips out and into the hand and make a fist, you know, just keep them warm as you go. The emergency packs add a little bit of flavor to the water, especially when it's cold like that. I have a tendency not to drink as much water as I really need to. So the emergency packs by adding flavor gives me that extra vitamin C too. It's just nice to have. Kill Kit, the Havilon. I love this knife. I've used it now for a few years deer hunting and I will probably never go back to a normal knife for skinning. And it's super lightweight. That thing plus extra blades is way less than a normal buck knife type of skinning knife. So just no problems at all there. Parachute cord. That'd be nice for tying up the game bags. Be nice for hanging food, which I didn't do. I figured I'll risk it, <laughs> but parachute cord. You never know when you're going to need that. So leave it in the pack. Tags and license, self-explanatory. Didn't bring flagging tape because I have a GPS. Gloves. I don't know why I have nothing for gloves because I definitely brought gloves. Oh, that's for the kill kit gloves. Never mind. I, yeah, I just don't use gloves when I got an animal out. I haven't for years. Game bags. So, so cotton pillowcases. So you can go this route. And the only reason I did this living in Minnesota is it's really hard to find game bags, obviously, unless I go to Cabela's and then you pay an arm and a leg. But if you're going to use pillowcases, king sized and cotton over polyester because the cotton's more breathable. So I paid, I don't even, I don't even know, like 15 bucks or something like that for four big king size cotton pillowcases at Walmart or Target or something around here. And then I drive out to Colorado Steamboat Springs has a Walmart and they got a whole shelf full of game bags. Those Allen ones, they're nice and stretchable. $10 I think they were. So I just picked some up. I was like, forget the, the cotton pillowcases. Headlamp. So I have a really nice headlamp. And when I say nice, I'm not talking about expensive. It was like $15. It was one of those Amazon ones that comes from China and it uses the Cree LED bulb, which is unbelievably bright when it's powered with those 18650 lithium ion batteries. The reason I brought or left it at home actually was because it's heavy, takes up a little bit more space and I'd probably want to have spare batteries for that. And the spare 18650 batteries are not cheap. So I just used the little cheap headlamp from Home Depot. It was like a $5 headlamp, runs on AAA batteries. And I brought six extra because not only did this headlamp run on AAAs, but my walkie talkies did as well. And I got the lithium, the ultimate lithium batteries from Energizer. Those things last something like nine times as long as alkaline and look at it, six of them weighs less than an ounce. So definitely go with the lithium batteries cameras. This was a tough decision deciding which ones to bring because I think my favorite camera right now for overall filming is the one that I'm filming this with right now, the Sony NEX 5R. But to bring that camera, I need to bring the camera, memory card, whatever lenses I'm going to bring. Usually I wouldn't just want to bring one lens. I'd want to bring more than one lens and the lenses are pretty heavy individually. Then I'd also need to bring a spare battery. I need to bring a USB cord with my big external battery. And that's a lot of weight. It's a lot of space. So I decided to leave it in the truck in favor of the Canon Vixia that I have that one. It's a little bit lighter than all those accessories that have to go with the NEX and it's got a way better zoom range. So it just fit. It doesn't have quite the low light capabilities, but that's all right for this hunt. I also decided not to bring the contour roam just because I didn't want to have to deal with it hanging on my head all day. So I figured I'd just use that Canon Vixia. And then if I get one down, then I'll go back to the truck, get the Sony NEX and film one of the other guys. But unfortunately, during that big snowstorm, the Canon Vixia got a little bit too much moisture, stopped working on me, kept giving me a memory card error. So a lot of the stuff that I filmed was actually with my cell phone on that video, believe it or not. Probably at least half of the footage, which also explains the bad audio. You know, 
it's nice to have a walkie talkie, but I would not want to rely on this for safety. These walkie talkies were advertised to have a 24 mile range. And when Matt and Travis or I were on the same side, usually the south side of a ridge where it's just that open Aspen a couple miles away, no problem getting a signal, but we could be a half a mile apart on opposite ends of the ridge. One of us is on the north side, one on the south side, no signal at all. So I think that if you really wanted to have a safe survival type form of communication, I'd say you'd probably want to rent a satellite phone. Giant Squid Lav. This is the lav mic that I'm using right now. I really like the microphone and it's one of those microphones that requires phantom power. It doesn't have its own battery source. And so I brought that out there forgetting that my Canon Vixia doesn't supply phantom power to the microphones and therefore I could not even use it. It was just a waste of space in my pack. Tripod, self-explanatory, audio recorder. I actually did not bring that along. The Garmin 62S, love this GPS. And I know I'm well behind on doing a review on it. I'm gonna get that out pretty soon. I'll say within a week, I'll have that Garmin 62S review out. Extra AAA batteries for the Garmin and I did not need to use all of them. I actually, the entire trip, only needed to switch batteries once on that Garmin, and I used it quite a bit. Cell phone, that was a good thing I had it along. It's not much of an emergency communication device because I never had a bar of service the entire time, but it did serve as a pretty good spare camera. Now onto the hunting gear. A little bit more minimal here. Rangefinder, used it a couple times. It's kind of a nice thing to have out there, even for rifle hunting, because it's really, really, really easy to underestimate ranges out there. Sometimes I'd be looking at a tree and I'd be like, well, you know, that's maybe like 300 yards. And then I'd pull out the range finder and it'd be like 800. Whoa, you know, not even close. So until you're really used to judging distances out there in that open space, definitely would recommend a range finder. Wind checker, I always just use the milkweed and the foam canister. It's what I use for deer hunting. It's what I used out there. Got to have something with those thermals. Sometimes it's so soft that you can't really feel anything, but that milkweed will still fly. Brought a couple calls. Never really needed to use them. Bugle. Didn't bring one along here. I'd probably want to bring a bugle in conjunction with the diaphragm calls if I went archery hunting though. Ton of rifle shells. I thought about bringing like five. I was like, ah, what the heck? I'll bring five more. Boots. I have. Cabela's Mindel uninsulated leather boots, and those things are just awesome. I never even really broke them in. I wore them on the Boundary Waters hunt, and I wore them on this hunt, and I probably put on 20, 30 miles. I haven't gone through the GPS and actually looked at how many miles I put on and how much elevation, but never had blisters. So comfortable. Just love these boots. And then the base top, it's a quarter zip, merino wool made by Cabela's. They actually just redid their merino wool line and it's really expensive. I actually got mine when it was the old line and they had it on clearance. So I got a really good deal on it. It was like $70, but now they're like 130, which is probably similar or a little bit more than what you would pay for for a first light, which is usually the go-to source for merino wool base layers. Thought about bringing a soft shell for the top and I just decided to leave it at home because it was extra weight, extra space, and it was a good thing I left it at home because I wouldn't have used it. Cabela's Berber fleece with wind shear. Great outer layer to have out there with the wind. Use that just about every day. A lot of times all I wore was my base layer and that jacket. It's a great camo pattern for out there too. The soft shell pants. This is a native species is the sub brand. I think it's a sub brand of Setlock. They don't sell them anymore, but they're just great pants. I really wish they still had those for sale. Liner socks. These, I did not have merino compression socks. I just used one of the four pairs that I had packed. They aren't compression, but they were, you know, 60% or so merino wool hiking socks. Base bottom, the Under Armour again, cold gear. I packed an additional pair and I never used it. I was fine using the ones that I had on 
And a lot of times those ones are in the pack too. So I definitely did not need two pairs. Fleece blazer and drapini. This is a typo because I already have that listed in the packed gear. I always wore this one and realistically it was a little bit too much weight for what I wanted to wear on a daily basis. I usually had that thing just sitting up on the top of my head like a gangster just to let the heat escape. I just used a blaze orange pheasant vest, nothing special. And for the amount of time that I spent hunting with a rifle, that's really all I need. Gloves, I really like these gloves. They're made by Under Armour and they have Primaloft 1 insulation, which is about the best warmth to weight ratio synthetic insulation that you can get. And my hands still got cold, like I said earlier, but apart from having like a three layer glove system or hand warmers, there's really no way getting around that in my opinion. Binoculars, 12 by 50 is probably a little bit on the heavy side of what I would have wanted out there. I think eight by 42 is usually what's recommended as a good Western pair of binoculars. But I did have a really nice harness system for them that I got on Amazon for about 15 bucks. So it really wasn't an issue to have those. Savage Axis, great rifle, great price. This thing's a tack driver for, you know, what you pay for it. Shooting the Nosler Acubon bullets, I was shooting just a hair over minute of angle. And I think if I had a Caldwell lead sled or something shooting off the bench, I probably could hit minute of angle with that without too much issue. So that's all I have really. The only things that I bought special for this trip were that Alps Outdoor Commander pack and the rifle. I actually, I bought the rifle for this trip. Other than that, most of the stuff I already had beforehand. Things that I absolutely would not leave the house without on a second trip going out here. A good tent, a good sleeping bag, a good stove, and a GPS. The tent, just because the weather can be so unbelievably bad and so unbelievably good in the same day, you gotta have something that can protect you from the elements. That REI quarter dome that I had, yeah, I had some really bad issues with frost. I had some really bad issues with condensation because a lot of the times when that wind would die down, there just wasn't enough circulation and the snow was caving in on the outside of the tent. So that kind of removed the outside rim for circulation. All I had was a little vent at the top and it just wasn't enough. Ton of condensation. It was running down the sides of the mesh, running down the insides of the rain fly, but it kept me alive. Uh, would have been nice to have a little bit more spacious tent, a two person tent instead of a one person tent. I think the ideal would be to have something that's like, uh, you know, like one of those Kuyu Mountain Star two person ones where you got a two person tent, so you got more room it's got a lot more stable tent structure, will hold up to the elements a lot better. And it's actually lighter than my one person tent, but something like that's like 500 bucks. Sleeping bag, again, I like down, but you do gotta be careful that you don't get it soaked. Then the stove, pocket rocket, I love it. It did not do quite as well as the jet boil in the wind, Travis had a jet boil. I think that that one performed a little bit better. I used less fuel, but the pocket rocket was lighter. I think that even though they say you're not supposed to use a windscreen, I think that I can probably use a piece of heavier gauge aluminum foil and make something that's not going to put the stove in risk of exploding, but still be able to block some of that wind. And I'll probably post a video on that when I figure something out. And then the GPS, Matt and I both had the same GPS. We both had the Garmin 62S as we both had the Colorado topo maps loaded on from GPS file depot. Travis didn't have a GPS and I don't know how he did it. <laughs> it's one thing to walk around during the day with a GPS. You don't really need it. You just look at the terrain, you look at the map, you can figure out where you are. But at night, if there's no snow and you can't follow your tracks back, it's so easy to get turned around back there. I just would not feel comfortable without a GPS at night. So yeah, that's about it. There's not a whole lot I would have changed on here doing this again. Would have been nice to have a lighter pack overall that has the capabilities of both a day pack and an expanded load hauler. Would have been nice to have a little bit more sturdy, lighter weight tent. But I mean, those are minor things. If I were to go back and do this on an archery hunt, I'd want to bring less of the bulky clothes. 
free up more space for camera gear. I'd probably want to buy a set of dedicated ultralight, breathable, packable rain gear. I'd probably want to use a little bit lighter pair of binoculars. I think it'd be pretty easy to 3D print an adapter for digibinning, which is basically like digiscoping where you just take a either a cell phone or a video camera and you put it behind a binocular lens and it allows you to get that zoomed in footage. And then one more thing that I want to touch on is hauling out meat. We never had to haul out meat and talking to other people, other people who are backpacking, other people who used horses. If you rent a horse on a trip like this, we talked to a few guys that did this, they said it absolutely is not worth the hassle. They said the horses can only use a certain amount of weight and when you rent one of those horses, you never know who's used them before, how they've been treated, what they're gonna act like, and half of the horse's weight that they can carry is taken up with the food that they need to pack in. Llamas, there's other problems with llamas. Um, same thing with mules. You don't need to bring in quite as much food, but they can't haul as much and they're not quite as durable. And the issue with hauling out your own meat is it's just a pain in the butt. You can definitely do it. It's easier if you got several guys doing one animal, but you still read a lot of stories where guys are like, yeah, I'm never doing that again. So the ideal scenario would be to set up something with a packer beforehand where you have them on a, like a satellite phone speed dial or something and you know you can say hey here's my coordinates i need you to come pick up the animal some people can do that some people have done that and it sounds like it's kind of hard to set up but if you can get that set up i think that would definitely be ideal so the next time i go out i'm going to try and set something like that up beforehand